So uh, I'm delighted to introduce our first speaker. It is going to be Mark Bottom, affiliated with Massey College, talking about Canadian financial institutions, their global ambitions, and corporate policies, 1900 to present. Thank you very much. I'm truly honored to be here today. Um, of course, with time constraints, I've had to cut 80% of my talk. Uh, and of course, that 80% is, is all the nit nitty gritty uh, details. So I, if, uh, if I am too high level, I apologize, but I hope uh, you'll uh, come up and ask me more specific questions outside of the talk as well. The early days of financial institutions in Canada can best be described as a period of innovation because much of what they offered in terms of financial inter intermediation was new for both themselves and their clients. Prior to the establishment of Canada's first fire and casualty insurance company in 1809, first banks, the Ban Montreal Bank in 1817 and the Bank of New Brunswick in 1820, the first life insurance company in 1844 and so on, financial intermediation occurred on what is best described as a barter system of trade. It is the inefficiencies of this trade that led to more formal corporate type of financial intermediation. And government oversight and regulation has been a constant in the history and is based on reporting and supervision. Despite this central government oversight, at this beginning, they primarily operated in local communities and served local interests and hence were not driven entirely by profit motives, but rather functioned as trustee savings banks. As a result, they generally were short-lived entities who could not sustain their risks with the minimum capital that they had and the stringent capital requirements that were imposed on them at that time. Their legislative framework was based on similar legislation in the United Kingdom. It was really only in the late 1870s when they were authorized to issue debentures that their stability and growth took off. As well, it was at this time that local banks, often private bankers, began to join together to create branch-style banking. And this is both in banking and insurance sector specifically. From the beginning of the 20th century to today, Canadian financial institutions have grown to dominate the domestic corporate business landscape. Their global ambitions during this time have fluctuated wildly in response to exogenous financial conditions, notably exchange rates, international economic crisis, and changes to domestic and international political landscapes, as has the net contribution from this business strategy to various performance metrics. In contrast, their approach to corporate social responsibility has steadily grown from an indirect factor in their business plans to a material and fiercely competitive and direct prized strategic component, with the growth in social policies today seen as a contributor, contributor to performance metrics. Let's examine these different business trajectories. The study of the history of a country's financial industry provides unique insight into that country's complete evolution of identity, including its culture, its politics, its art, and, and so on. In this context, the financial industry itself can be seen as a microcosm of the country as a whole. The study of Canada's financial industry is key to understanding the general social history of Canada and how it has developed and functioned over time as a society and a nation. The country's success and failures on all fronts can be traced back to show an influence by the financial industry. Having an efficient and effective monetary and financial system is central to the social development of a country. There are some key financial ingredients to a well-functioning, stable, growing, and successful economic system that in turn dictates the extent of social prosperity, satisfaction, and contentedness in the country. In short, economic success over time can be equated to low inflation, the existence and stability of property rights in the country, which is the impetus to meaningful employment through business organizations, and the existence and stability of, of political and social organizations to monitor and enforce those property rights. Financial systems are integral to this process of creating economic success because they are the means of executing financial flows that allow individuals and organizations to operate together and to create and to grow. Through the operation of the financial system, transactions between these individuals and organizations can occur which allocate scarce capital to productive means and allocate the returns to participants. The link between the financial system and social progress, then, is very quite clear. 
Among others, there are seven key factors which affect the nature and extent of financial firms' participation in social <coughs> programs. And uh, there are more than seven, but I will highlight seven. First is economies of scale, which in turn dictate margins required to profitably run a business. Secondly, sources of funding for capital investment, whether domestic or foreign. Third, the pace of innovation and invention in the industry, because this in turn affects profitability and the ability to participate. Fourth, the degree of competitiveness in the financial industry. Fifth, the role of government in providing social services and how financial inf firms interact with government in this process. Fifth, uh, the tax revenues of finance co financial companies, which in turn finance social programs, and then overall global risk and exposure. Now, as the world entered the 20th century, Canada's financial industry was in the latter stages of moving from a country which relied on individuals to allocate capital and act as financial intermediaries to one which relies principally on economic, on corporate entities to do those jobs, albeit corporate entities that are under the rule of government regulation. Economies of scale were coming into play which smoothed this transition and sped up its process. Margins still had to be large in order to create the incentives for financial firms to, cr to cr be created, grow, and prosper. This meant, of course, that Canadians continued to rely more heavily at the time on government to directly provide social services and infrastructure at this stage than was the case in other rapidly growing Western uh, countries, particularly the United States. As well, in terms of large-scale capital-intensive development, such as transportation, electricity, and so on, the country relied extensively on foreign sources of funding as opposed to domestic savings. As you would expect, there is a good correlation between the sources of funding for economic development and growth and the degree to which those funders contribute to domestic social development. In its early incarnation, before and shortly after Confederation in the mid-1800s, capital markets in the financial industry and its participants in Canada were regional in terms of domestic makeup serving local, principally agrarian and small manufacturing demands. However, by the turn of the new 20th century, the financial industry was in the midst of changing into national entities, principally through consolidation by acquisition. This corporate activity allowed Canadian financial institutions across the spectrum to expand their balance sheet relative to their reserves, thereby improving lending conditions and enhancing margins. International events now began to play a bigger role in determining the extent to which Canadian financial institutions developed a sense of social responsibility. This occurred primarily by way of the assessment of the risk of that to their business. At this particular time, the global economic recession of 1903 triggered a short-lived financial panic. This was followed by the recession and financial panic of 1907. These two events, though closely related in time, had two distinct outcomes for the Canadian financial industry. 1903 was still in the early days of consolidating regional financial enterprises and hence caused a greater defensive reaction than occurred in 1907, where by such time Canadian firms had moved quite along extensively in creating interprovincial national financial industries, institutions. This change structure, albeit in a short period of time, meant that 1907 was a far less of an issue than 1903 compared to the United States where 1907 was more of a critical issue than 1903. Canada's financial industry emerged relatively unscathed, although as Joe Martin has pointed out, not entirely unscathed, because of its quick ability to move liquidity to areas where it was needed most. As a result of these global events, Canada was now being viewed internationally as having a relatively safe, stable and robust financial industry at the time. This international view meant that interest rate spreads between foreign and domestic bond rates were relatively low, and this low cost of capital aided an, a rise in liquidity for Canadian business, particularly in the burgeoning industrial and resource extraction industries. As well, interest rate spreads across the country diminished due to the competitive nature of these merging national financial entities. As a result of these factors, and coupled with international demand, Canada experienced a phenomenal net investment rate of 15.2% in the period up to the First World War. And this compares, for example, to the peak achieved in Great Britain during its heyday of economic growth from the Industrial Revolution of only 8.2%. The existing banks as a whole grew spectacularly during the first few years of the new century, along with this Canadian economy. Between 1900 and 1913, the number of bank branches grew from 708 
to 2,962, and the assets of the banks grew from 500 million to 1.5 billion. So this was particularly noticeable in Western Canada, along with an immigration boom. Bank branches for all major banks were quickly established in London, England, as part of the new century to facilitate the London flotations of government and railroad debt securities. The banks, however, left the flotation of industrial securities, including those of utility companies, to the investment bankers because they included attached ordinary shares to the debt issuance, which was much too risky for the banks themselves to undertake. The life insurance industry also grew spectacularly during this time. In contrast to the banks, however, the most notable difference was in the international growth of the life insurance industry. While the banks basically did not grow their international business at all, life insurers grew at a remarkable rate outside of Canada. The most notable was Sun Life Assurance of Montreal. It quickly grew to be the largest life company in 1908 with above industry average growth by aggressively expanding into the then emerging markets of South America and so on. Canada Life Assurance established an office in the UK in 1902 and Confed in 1906 and others followed so that the six largest Canadian life companies were all operating abroad and 20% of their total premium income came from outside of Canada. Sun Life itself was receiving half of its premium, life premium income from abroad. Canadian life companies looked to growth outside of Canada principally because the domestic market was too small to sustain the minimal margins between the cost of doing business in, in the country and the retaining of reserves to, to undertake the risk profile of that business. Economies of scale simply could not support the aggressive nature of the growth nature of that industry. Stock brokers came into their own as important financial intermediaries during this time in Canada. However, they did so to serve the specific needs of a small cadre of elite businessmen located in Montreal and Toronto, principally. These successful business individuals created their own investment brokerage firms to facilitate their personal financial investing activities, not to serve some wider community purpose or national program. The impetus for the creation of these new stock brokerage firms was the boom in the industrial merger, acquisition, and financing activity at the turn of the century. And the bulk of the financing for this occurred not in Canada, but in the United Kingdom. Between 1900 and 1913, Canada imported 500 million pounds of capital for industrial activity, and 75% of this came from the London financial market. Because of this spectacular growth in the country's economy, there was less of a demand on corporate financial entities to provide social program financing. The Canadian population was changing very quickly at this time through immigration, and they were attracted in part relative to the relatively good economic growth and prosperity of the country. And this immigration came to Canada not with any preconceived notion of social programming sustenance, but rather for a perhaps naive view of economic opportunity. Thus, there was little to no demand placed on financial institutions at that time to participate directly in social programming. In fact, rather than participate in the financial demands of social development, Canadian financial institutions did so, in general, by way of purchasing materially increased quantities of government debt. And the government generally led the charge on social investment, including infrastructure. Interestingly, foreign investors, particularly from the United States, began to focus on direct equity investment, whereas Canadian domestic investors focused on debt market investment at this time, and particularly government debt. The federal government took most action on social policy in response to what is believed to be a reluctance of insurance companies to encourage individual savings for retirement at the time, for example. The federal government in 1908 passed the Government Annuities Act, being the first piece of legislation to create a pension market. This social policy initiative increased the public's perception that it was government who would take care of them and not corporations. This would be uh, followed by uh, various policies by the provincial governments as well. An important development occurred at this time in response to a growing distru regional distrust of concentrated financial institutions, the development of cooperative financial organizations, and specifically in 1900, the first Cas Populaire was founded in Quebec. The outbreak of war in 1914 completely sucked financial liquidity out of the Canadian economy. Capital inflow as a percentage of GNP declined from 12.4% annually between 1911 and 15 to 1.2% in 16 to 20. The onset of the Great War forced the charter banks to take on an increasing role in government financing and liquidity, 
by firstly the purchase of Dominion notes for reserves and investment purposes, secondly assisting the federal government to obtain debt financing in the United States, and thirdly assisting in the promotion and sale of victory bonds by the population in general. Stock brokerage activity came to an abrupt halt and the saving grace for the investment brokerage industry again was the creation of victory bonds. The collapse of the London to Canada financial flow forced investment brokers to shift their focus to the United States and away from the United Kingdom. In terms of social advancement, the loss of men in the workforce forced the banks to employ women for the first time, though entirely in the positions of clerks and tellers. However, life insurance companies were the first financial industry participants in Canada to experiment in hiring women, with the Great West Life creating a department of women in 1914. Post-war, increasing American demand reinvigorated the Canadian natural resource and industrial sectors with non-knock-on effects for the financial industry. Most notable was the resumption of the industrial merger boom. As the economy regained its strength and resumed rapid growth in the 1920s, the federal government returned to a focus of developing a retirement insurance plan. In 1927, the Old Age Pension Act was passed, which introduced the means test for federal government pensions for people retiring at age 70. And this, in turn, did lead to a growth in, corporate, in the number of corporate trustee pension plans. At this very early stage, though, there was no legislation or regulatory oversight to guarantee the adequacy of assets to meet future liabilities. But once again, the, it was the federal government which led the way on social programming. In terms of banking, part of the reason for this was the concern for the security of the banks themselves, as you would imagine, and because credit had dried up. The end result is that the number of chartered banks in the country dropped from 30 in 1910 to only 10 in 1928 through consolidation and bank failure, and notably the Home Loan Bank of Canada. The trade sector dominated the Canadian economy, and in particular, growing trade with the United States, to such an extent that the banks and the regulators tended to manage their affairs and legislations very conservatively. They sought monetary stability to ensure a stable exchange rate rather than an aggressive, innovative banking system that would be responsive to the growing complex investment and social needs of an industrial economy. Growth and stability of the life companies was the norm for the 1920s. Part of this was because the Great War had made the public sensitive need for life insurance, and the life insurance share of total assets, financial intermediate assets, grew from 12.5% in 1920 to 25% in 1930. And growth, uh, this occurred growth uh, both domestically and internationally. And Sun Life became the largest Canadian operating business uh, in a, on a global, scale, in a global stage. The stock market crashed in 1929 and subsequent global economic depression would have, as you expect, a material impact on the development of the Canadian financial industry. It also increased significantly the demand for social services, as you would expect. This need would not be met by the financial industry itself, as it was in no position to absorb the costs associated with initiatives like that. Charter banks were not lending, and there was widespread naivety about the relationship between money contraction and its impact on economic growth and employment. The stock market crash exposed the public to shenanigans within the brokerage industry. This, along with the drying up of credit, increased the level of public cynicism towards the financial industry, and that did not bode well for the financial industry to take on social policy initiatives. Contrarily, the government was increasingly looked at to institute a regulatory regime to supervise the financial industry. There were many initiatives created in this process, including the creation of the central bank in 1935, and because the big issue in the banking sector was erratic liquidity through an overall lack of control of the money supply because of the lack of the central bank. It was the life insurance companies in the financial industry that were exposed to the downturn in the stock market, since they had invested heavily in common stock and new legislation in 1932 restricted investment in common stocks to 15% at book value of their portfolio. And this change materially altered the corporate culture of life insurance companies in terms of investing in social policy initiatives. The life industry, however, would benefit from the passage of the Dominion Housing Act in 1935 because they were the principal providers of, of mortgage financing. Life insurance growth would benefit through their bond portfolios henceforth which doubled from 30 to 60 percent of the total investment portfolio during that decade. With respect to co-op organizations, these emerging intermediaries gained greater growth momentum in the 1930s as small rural farmers felt abandoned and disenfranchised by the large financial organizations, especially after the failure of the home bank. In 
Their market share was very small at this juncture, but they would grow and become a, a material part of the financial industry. Following the Depression, the Second World War dominated economic activity and workings of the financial industry. The great social policy introduced at this time was federally funded unemployment insurance under the Unemployment and Social Insurance Act of 1940. With general full employment uh, during the war years, business paid little attention to social issues. Instead, the financial institutions were the subject of moral suasion to aid in the financing of the war. And they were relied extensively on that role. The outbreak of war had an immediate impact on foreign operations of the life insurance industry since many of their overseas markets were heavily involved in the war. And this is when they abandoned significant numbers of small foreign countries that they had been operating in for a substantial number of years. Insurance companies were very active investors in victory bonds. And by the end of the war, for example, Sun Life held half of its total investment assets in victory bonds, totaling $650 million. So as you can see, the pressure on financial institutions during the Great War to participate in social policy was not direct assistance to the general population, but indirectly through participation in government debt financing. Another existence, example of this occurred in 1945 when the government created the Central Mortgage and Housing Corporation. And that would be a milestone event uh, since the dramatic growth in home ownership uh, was an asset that would in future spurn growth and innovation in credit markets. The relative direct complacency of financial firms began to change, however, once the war was over. And this change coincided with a regenerated global perspective on economic and financial matters, obviously ignited by Bretton Woods Agreement and the Marshall Plan. The imposition of fixed exchange rates coincided with a surge in demand for Canadian raw materials, goods and services driven by global economic growth. As you would expect, these developments had a particular impact on Canadian financial institutions. At this juncture, that it is at this juncture that the banks made their initial, though still tentative, moves into lending to corporations for larger long-term capital expenditures. And part of this move was in response to competitive pressure from the federal government itself, who established the Industrial Development Bank. As the world entered the 50s, Canada entered a new world of, quote, corporate capitalism. There was significant growth in Canadian consumer credit by, driven by increasing home ownership. Industrialization brought wealth to the public and greatly increased the size of the middle class. That would spur on corporate merger and acquisition activity and the participation of the growing middle class in this process. And the proliferation of financial services firms to service those, that middle class. Competition would grow intensely. There was a wave of capital investment by American firms. Accompanying the developments of the employment market was the federal government, which again took another important social initiative when it introduced Old Age, Old Age Security Act in 1951 and the RRSP, Registered Retirement Savings Plan, in 1957. This in turn encouraged insurance companies, banks, and trust companies to establish eligible savings products. The buildup of foreign deposits of the bank at this time was the second most important development as far as sources of funds in their history, after the buildup of savings accounts in the immediate period after Confederation. It was in mid-50s to 60s that the professional management area of financial firms began, that the largest of such was first created in-house depart corporate departments to begin addressing social issues directly, usually in conjunction with marketing departments and community outreach programs. This coincided with a period during which pension product annuities, annuities, accident and sickness insurance, and mortgage insurance were all introduced as new products to the financial industry. A lot of these innovations created a form of profitable social services to their clients, being retirement and home ownership being the principal too. Well, if the decades of the 50s could be characterized in which the Canadian financial industry began to simmer, <coughs> The decade of the 60s is one in which it began to boil. Firstly, it was a decade when the middle class moved into management positions and would emerge as an entrepreneurial class with disposable wealth. It was, it was a decade when the charter banks, the, particip the dominant participants, moved out of their narrow focus on short-term savings and expanded their domestic financial intermediary strategies as well as their international business. Thirdly, governments would take significant steps forward in terms of regulation and direct participation in the financial industry. Fourthly, there was a rapid increase in the size of the credit markets, which would lead to new definitions of money supply, the velocity of money and leverage. And lastly, towards the end of the 60s, the booming U.S. economy would encourage the country's brokers and investment bankers to look beyond their own borders in search of growth. <coughs> 
1966, the Canada Pension Plan was formally created as a mandatory earnings-related social insurance program on a pay-as-you-go program. Uh, the CAS was, and OMERS were, were created at that time as government pension plans. And this, at, also importantly at this time, the Canada Deposit Insurance Corporation was established to create insurance for um, depositors. The most truly global opportunities in the financial industry came in the banking sector as international banking was now given an enormous, enormous stimulus during this decade. They began, charter banks began growing internationally on a significant scale, with non-Canadian branches growing from 149 in 1963 to 189 in 1968. The bulk of their growth came in the form of euro-dollar intermediation. The bank's foreign deposits and foreign loans as a proportion of total assets more than doubled in the decade to 21%. In addition, their foreign assets as a percentage of total assets doubled to 50% by 1970. In a new focus on consumer lending, the banks significantly increased their market share of mortgage loans thanks to the Bank Act revision of 1967. The insurance sector would see significant structural change in this decade. It would be the biggest loser in the increasingly competitive landscape. Their market share declined from 47% in 1962 to 20% in 1971 due primarily to the obsolescence of their product line. This also witnessed the growth of the institutional investor this 1960 period, principally pension and other pooled funds, which demanded a different service from investment bankers than, than the retail investor did. The decade of the 70s was to be defined by its inflation and volatility in global exchange rates and interest rates. And this, in turn, led to the development of a futures market to manage that volatility. And, and there was more financial intermediary oversight by international regulations, such as the Basel Committee of 1974. The oil-driven inflation saw bank loan growth to emerging markets increase substantially as they recycled petrodollars to these uh, markets. The bond business of the investment bank was equally busy with a particular emphasis on federal and provincial government debt issues as those uh, obviously entities managed increasing deficits. The Bank of Canada in 1982 announced it was abandoning growth targets of money supply and moved to interest rates to, as a means to fight inflation. And the financial industry had to adjust accordingly. It would be volatile and challenging. Um, the pressures for offsetting social policies continued to increase, and the financial industry's reputation suffered with sluggish economic growth and high unemployment. In mid-1980s, new policies were targeted to the growing presence of international banking transactions, and they highlighted the growing interconnectedness of international banks. Higher interest rates affected banks particularly through their international loan exposure to emerging markets and they began to default on those loans, Argentina, Brazil, Mexico being the most prominent, and, and then later Russia. Um, and this was very material, as was the collapse of the domestic uh, uh, energy market with the failed dome petroleum alone. The cost was over $4 billion, which represented half the total capital invested in Canadian banks at that time. There was a fast-growing liquidity crisis, and several banks uh, ran into trouble and were closed, Mercantile, Canadian Commercial Bank, Northern Bank, Continental Bank, and so on. However, there were innovations introduced, uh, specifically the introduction of futures contracts on both stock market and individual companies, and these were embraced by institutional investors as a way to hedge their exposure. By the 1990s, um, they began using technology and sophisticated trading programs with increasing velocity and volume as innovation abounded in the industry. In 1996, the use of Internet for stock trading was almost non non-existent. By 1999, 27% of investors used the Internet for trading investment product. Technology created a particular challenge, and two particular crises resulted from that, the 1995 Barings Bank collapse and the 1998 collapse of the long-term capital management in the United States. And this, of course, raised awareness of, reg of, of, the, of the regulators, and, and policies had to be implemented for that. And mutual life companies were facing a slowing uh, uh, growth path, and the government regulators simplified with the industry and allowed them to demutualize. By 2010, the Canadian financial industry employed a total of 750,000 individuals. The City of Toronto alone accounted for 300,000 of these jobs, making it the third largest service centre in North America, behind New York and Chicago. 
a benign monetary policy since the beginning of the new millennium has been accompanied by a good deal of global financial challenges which impacted the financial industry. And the most serious of this, of course, was the 2007 and 8 collapse uh, through subprime mortgage market led by innovative financing vehicles using securitization and derivatives. Why did Canadian charter banks fare better than their global counterparts? In part, this was due to the Hawk and Quinter Accord of 87, which arose from the previous liquidity crisis in the mid-1980s and prohibited the banks from using the capital base of their investment bank as leverage to their bank lending business. The relatively good financial health of Canadian charter banks was recognized in 2009 when the annual Global Competitive uh, Report um, ranked Canada's banks as the soundest in the world. A notable strategic shift has been their focus on diversifying business operations throughout the new millennium into mutual funds and asset management businesses, as has been the case for, for life insurance companies. Today, Canada's financial industry has embraced social issues aggressively to distinguish each other from competitors. These range from sports sponsorships to health issues to issues of diversity and to cultural and arts issues. Each financial firm has developed one or two pillars of support through which they channel material funds in the form of sponsorship. It is notable that, in general, each of these initiatives reports under the general marketing and promotion umbrella within their corporate structure. Each firm has evolved to take a program perspective on their social initiatives and have moved away from event perspectives that was prominent in the 1980 to 2000 period. And this change in, change in focus has been driven by shareholder activism to better link expenditure on social programming to overall bank growth and profits for shareholders. I hope this very fast and brief overview of the history of the Canadian financial industry and the extent of its participation in global um, uh, issues and in domestic social programming has provided some insight that will lead to some good questions. Thank you.